Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. When I was younger, I, I saw a movie that had an, a, a kind of a big impression on me. I'm not really sure to this day why this movie had an impression on me, but it, it has. And from time to time, I go back to it. And this week, I found that it was kind of fluttering around as I was thinking about the sermon for today. And uh, the movie is Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which uh, came out actually in 1958. Some of you nodding your head, so you might remember that. And one of my favorite people in the film, and he's a terrible man, is Big Daddy. Uh, and of course, if, if you remember the film, it's basically a nonstop argument from the beginning to the very end. And in one of the arguments between Big Daddy and Brick, the son, uh, There are some words that come up that that I want to wrestle with a little bit uh, today. Big Daddy Pollock says, you're a 30-year-old kid. Soon you'll be 50-year-old kid, pretending you're hearing cheers when there ain't any, dreaming and drinking your life away. Heroes in the real world live 24 hours a day, not just two hours in a game. Then he says, Mendacity, Big Daddy questions. You won't live with mendacity? Well, you're an expert at it. Now, mendacity is a big word that you all can impress one another with uh, at a dinner party. (laughs) It basically means dishonesty, untruthfulness. It means deceit. And one of my favorite Uh, definitions is the fabrication of deceit. It is to lie to others, to lie to oneself, to fabricate a fictional life for yourself. Big Daddy is speaking about mendacity because he's trying to help Brick, which I don't think he does a very good job at, to understand that he is building a life that is, in the end, not real. What always sticks with me is the term itself. A life of mendacity is exactly what I think our scripture today is talking about. Speaking about living a life that isn't real. It's offering us a vision of a life where we pretend that our true actions, our real actions are unseen, where our wrongs are unaccounted for, where our little white storied lives uh, 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 of living, of untruth are hidden and our lies believed, our hurts that we hand out not felt, Our motives, always just our personal truths, uncontested. The life of mendacity, adults play it well, and we teach our children well. In the wilderness of our lives, there is a continuous echo, though, of a voice crying in the wilderness, inviting us to live a different way. Now, in all honesty, uh, and I, and I, I'm, it's not like I don't live a life of mendacity, to be honest. I live a mendacious life as well because I'm a human being. And I think part of what we have to recognize is that this is a human gift. Uh, if we think about the book of Genesis, it's the gift that gets us kicked out of Eden in that story, right? It's, it's this life lived differently than the Garden of Eden that gets everybody in trouble. I think we do this out of a true and honest desire to not suffer to avoid pain ourselves, uh, to keep from feeling pain. Uh, But the voice keeps calling to us, inviting us to participate in a different life, in the life of Jesus Christ. I would say in the audacious life of Jesus Christ, 
to have some audacity in our living rather than mendacity. The voice itself suggests that God is coming into the world, at least in our scripture. John the Baptist is suggesting that God is going to be incarnate and that that's going to have a very real impact upon us. That while we suffer, that God is coming to take on that suffering and that God will have a human experience in which God is crucified and make an audacious claim that Christ's suffering will bring to us salvation and that we ourselves, through the power of the cross, will have the opportunity to have a different resurrected life now and in the future. The second audacious claim, I think, that's being made by John the Baptist today is that we are the ones to straighten the crooked paths. And I had never noticed this before. But if you read through the scripture, it says make the path straight. It doesn't say God's coming to make them straight. It says you make the path straight. It says you bring the valleys low. We are the ones who wall up our lives, who raise the valleys, if you will, to keep God out so that we can continue to live a life where we are the demigods in charge of it. Instead, perhaps our prayer ought to be one like John Donne prays, batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but not breathe and shine and seek to men that I may rise and stand, overthrow me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. It is our work. Scripture invites to take action now in this life to cease our mendacious ways and to live audaciously for Christ. We're invited to be accountable for our lives, to be accountable for lives that are to be lived with mercy and forgiveness and kindness and love. We're invited to live differently than the world and to set aside hate and polarization. We're called to reject the life of mendacity completely and to live an audacious life. And this comes to us especially in this season of Advent as we're preparing. So we can't solve it all today. And you and I both know that as we approach Advent this year, it's likely to be, if we don't take some particular action, to be just like all the other Advents that we've had. Now, I'm, I'm in my 55th year, and that's a lot of Advents. Some of you might have had a few more. But based on my experience, this is the way Advent goes. We get our Advent candles out, and we might even get a little Advent prayer. And we might say, we're going this week to eat dinner at the table. And we're going to say these prayers, maybe even read a little bit of scripture and light the candle at home. And it starts out pretty good. Well, by next week, which will be the third week, we will stop lighting the candles and stop saying the prayers. We might do it here in church, but at home it'll cease to be. The busyness of Christmas will take it up instead. It's very hard for us to be attentive. The power of a life of mendacity is strong, actually, and pushes against us. So I want to invite you to one discipline. I'm going to invite you to do one thing. And forget, if you don't make it through all four candles, great. That's fine. Light them on Christmas Day and act like you did. I don't care about that. All right? And you can tell the bishop said that, you know, I'm like, how come these other ones are so tall? Bishop said I could just light them on Christmas Day. That's fine. I want to invite you to something a little more serious. And it's not hard, <laughs> but it is going to take some thinking by you, okay? I'm doing this, by the way, so you can join me. Do something good every day for somebody else. It really doesn't have to be much harder than that. 
You can begin to live an audacious Christian life one step at a time, and I'm inviting you right now to do just between now. Look, I'm, this is the second week of Advent. You already, you already lost seven days, so you guys are ahead of the whole team. You're just going to have to do it last. So I want you to do one good thing every day for somebody else. It can be a spouse. It can be a child. It can be a grandchild. It can be a person in line with you. At the grocery store, you can pay for somebody's coffee. There's a, there's a gazillion things that you can do for somebody else that is nice. But here, that's the easy part. Here's the hard part. You can't tell anybody about it. Just do it. Offer it to God privately as a prayer. Do something good as Christ has done and is doing for you. But do not take the glory for it. Offer it privately and in prayer to God. And when you do this, I actually believe that you will have some sense of what it means for God to become incarnate and to be a servant and savior of others. Each day as you do a good work, you will have an understanding of what it means to love somebody else, whether you know them or not. By doing this, I promise your Advent and Christmas will be different. You will begin to dissolve your life of mendacity and begin to feel in a very small way and then in big ways that you are adding to the audacious life of Christ in this world. As our second reading said, you will have a sense that your love and God's love through you is overflowing out into the world. So I invite you to an audacious Advent practice. Do some good for someone each day. Be merciful when you are tempted not to forgive. When you don't want to be kind, be kind. Make small good things happen for others. For in doing this, you will actually change the way you experience Advent and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.